Hello everyone, I'm Danny Roddy, and today we're going to read a new article that I just posted on my web blog entitled The Centrality of the Liver and Pattern Baldness, Estrogen, Aspirin, and IGF-1. After consuming only meat and water every day for two years, there came a point where I felt like I was constantly on edge. This feeling was not only evident to me, but anyone who was around me on a regular basis, especially my former bandmates. For instance, the singer of Dakota, who I was closest to, told me that 99% of the time he was around me, he felt like he was walking on eggshells. This eggshell walking was most evident on tour where I was a complete raging lunatic, regularly throwing temper tantrums in protest of the guitar player's actions who I had a love-hate relationship with. In retrospect, this orientation is almost expected given my no-carb diet, which induced a state of near constant low blood sugar. The effects of low blood sugar on one's mood is best described by pioneering stress physiologist Hans Selye in his 1976 book, The Story of Adaptation Syndrome. During his time as a medical student, Selye's professor injected insulin in the students one by one so they would better recognize the signs of hypoglycemia. The demonstration was running smoothly until the professor injected a classmate with a learning disability who was universally adored. Upon receiving the injection, the sweet student transformed into a monster and began wrestling with the other students. While being forcefully restrained, the professor shoved candy in the student's mouth, causing him to snap out of the insulin-induced tailspin. This concluded the experiment. Similar to the student, low thyroid individuals are especially susceptible to low blood sugar, or hypoglycemia. In Dr. Broda Barnes' 1978 classic, Hope for Hypoglycemia, It's Not Your Mind, It's Your Liver, he noted that in patients with poor thyroid activity, the liver was unable to store sufficient amounts of sugar in the form of glycogen. During periods of fasting, instead of balancing the blood sugar and restraining the stress response, a low thyroid person essentially ran out of sugar requiring compensation from the stress substances, adrenaline and glucagon in the short term, and cortisol in the long term. An impaired liver and an excess of adrenaline and cortisol not only affect behavior, but can cause systemic effects in the entire organism. For example, the increased concentration of these substances and the subsequent release of fatty acids to use as fuel appears to be part of a much bigger attempt to slow the entire system down by reducing the efficient production of energy, i.e. glucose to carbon dioxide, in order to go longer on less. While this adaptive response is useful for survival, it has a negative impact on the energy-intensive process of hair growth. A major force acting against the growth of hair, I think, is the increased synthesis of estrogen. The liver is majorly responsible for detoxifying estrogen in the body. When the liver becomes impaired, for example, in hypothyroidism or cirrhosis, both estrogen and prolactin, a pituitary hormone that estrogen antagonizes, tend to increase. In excess, estrogen is toxic to the liver, and in a vicious cycle, estrogen impairs liver function. While the current climate of citizen hair loss research appears to be extremely confused on the role of estrogen in pattern baldness, I think historically it has always been viewed as a growth inhibitor. As early as 1945, it was known that estrogen had a negative effect on hair growth. Even Dr. James B. Hamilton, the physician that coined the concept of male pattern baldness, noted the anti-hair properties of estrogen. In Montagna's 1958 epic, The Biology of Hair Growth, they stated that it is agreed that estrogenic hormones inhibit hair growth. Estrogenic contraceptive drugs can induce male pattern baldness. And more recently, in 1994, Schmidt et al. found increased levels of estrogen in males with pattern hair loss. Hormone-like messengers called prostaglandins, which Garza et al. found to inhibit hair growth in 2012, are increased by estrogen. Ciprodorone acetate has historically been useful in treating pattern baldness in both men and women. While often labeled as an anti-androgen, ciprodorone acetate has a strong progesterone potency and reduces estrogen levels down to castrate levels. When topical progesterone and estrogen were compared in 1975 for treating baldness, the authors felt that progesterone was more effective than estrogen, but that thyroid hormone had the most scientific rationale. Estrogen increases the pituitary hormone prolactin, and prolactin can mimic the effects of androgens. Prolactin inhibits hair growth and is associated with pattern baldness. Both hormones suppress thyroid function, and low thyroid function is associated with so-called male pattern baldness. Thyroid hormone is needed to produce the anti-estrogen progesterone, and active thyroid hormone is produced largely in the liver. 
A decrease in the rate of metabolism and the subsequent decrease in liver functionality increases the synthesis of estrogen in a few ways. In a situation where sugar is purposely being restricted or is being used inefficiently, such as diabetes, levels of lactic acid tend to increase. Sometimes it's said that lactic acid is a useful fuel. However, in a process called the Cori cycle, lactic acid is sent to the liver, where it requires glycogen to be converted back into glucose. It should be pointed out that this process is essentially a setback, as stealing the liver's important reserve of sugar is constructive for survival, but not necessarily the energy-intensive process of hair growth. It is also said that diabetics can't use sugar, but the increased production of lactic acid in the blood of diabetics suggests that sugar does get into the cell, but it is oxidized inefficiently to lactic acid instead of carbon dioxide, suggesting the central role of metabolic stress in diabetes. I think the increased production of lactic acid is meaningful, as an efficient metabolism restrains the production of lactic acid. The increased concentration of lactic acid and decrease in carbon dioxide can increase estrogen synthesis and the reliance on substances that mobilize fatty acids as an alternative backup fuel. An increased concentration of fat in the blood is metabolically stressful. If the diet has contained a disproportionate amount of polyunsaturated to saturated fats in the diet, the stress tends to self-accelerate, increasing the synthesis of estrogen. Estrogen can increase the synthesis of hormone-like messengers called prostaglandins. There are opposing views on the nature of prostaglandins, but their appearance seems to be exclusively negative in pattern baldness. For example, prostaglandin D2 inhibits hair growth. Prostaglandin E2 can increase the activity of aromatase. PGE2 and the COX-2 pathway are targets for cancer therapy. Prostaglandins interfere with the efficient use of glucose, the main source of fuel for hair follicles. Additionally, prostaglandins can intensify the stress reaction by activating the pituitary. W.D. Denkla believed that the function of the pituitary was to decrease tissue's responsiveness to thyroid hormone. An impaired liver produces less steroid binding protein or sex hormone binding globulin. SHBG is decreased in pattern baldness, which explains the higher ratio between free testosterone and testosterone. In addition to more free testosterone, a lack of SHBG also increases estrogen, as SHBG binds and neutralizes estrogen in the blood. In addition to less SHBG, an impaired liver produces inadequate albumin. In 1970, Jordan et al. found that serum albumin showed significant correlation with the protein content of growing hair root bulbs, and that there was a significant correlation between the percentage of growing hairs, their bulb diameters, and protein content, which in turn correlated with the protein intake of the subject. Another feature of an impaired liver is a decreased level of insulin-like growth factor 1, or IGF-1. Many things are said about the nature of IGF-1, however, in the context of baldness, it appears to be involved in healthy hair growth. In fact, one paper suggested that IGF-1 was a promising drug candidate for baldness therapy. IGF-1 should not be confused with growth hormone. Growth hormone tends to rise and fall with the adaptive stress substances such as prolactin, while IGF-1 decreases with age and during malnutrition. When people talk about IGF-1 as plug-and-play cancer fuel, I think the statement is extremely misleading. First, IGF-1 decreases with age and is highest during youth, when cancer is least likely to occur. Supplemental estrogen significantly decreases the liver's production of IGF-1. Speaking of cancer, estrogens are among the best known of growth stimulants, tend to increase with age in both sexes, and promote Warburg's cancer metabolism, i.e. aerobic glycolysis. Thyroid works in the opposite direction. In addition to keeping thyroid function up, minimizing the polyunsaturated fats, and consuming an easy-to-digest diet, I think there are some additional therapies to support liver function. In his article, Aspirin, Brain, and Cancer, Dr. Pete notes that very often people ignore his suggestion to consume aspirin based on what seems to be a very strong cultural bias. I had a similar orientation when I first read Dr. Pete's article. But since experimenting with it, I found aspirin to be a cheap and effective anti-inflammatory. Rather than damaging the liver like other over-the-counter anti-inflammatories, aspirin appears to play a protective role. For example, high doses of acetaminophen, the main ingredient in Tylenol, has been shown to induce severe liver damage. However, in an experiment when mice were administered aspirin concurrently with Tylenol, they experienced invulnerability to liver damage. Aspirin is useful for inhibiting the Randall cycle and fat-induced insulin resistance, may become a new drug for osteoporosis, 
and can support the metabolism similar to thyroid hormone. Aspirin can deplete vitamin K, so it might be a good idea to supplement it at the same time. Also, dissolving aspirin in warm water and consuming it with a meal may help overcome any possibility of intestinal irritation. In stress, the enzyme tryptophan hydroxylase tends to increase, synthesizing serotonin from the amino acid tryptophan. As I've mentioned, excess serotonin is probably a fundamental factor in the genesis of pattern baldness, and limiting its production is probably worthwhile. In contrast to muscle meat, protein sources that provide gelatin, e.g. oxtail, shanks, broth, chicharrones, are deficient in tryptophan and contain large amounts of the anti-inflammatory amino acid glycine. Glycine protects against liver damage from alcohol, bacterial endotoxin, and may be a chemoprotective agent. In 2012, Dr. Zeev Pam noted that from his many years of experience in his clinical practice, that oral gelatin was a safe and effective treatment for pattern hair loss. Great Lakes makes some high-quality gelatin supplements, however, they're becoming increasingly expensive. A few tablespoons mixed in with coffee or juice is probably enough to obtain the benefits of glycine. Oxtail, chicharrones, and lamb shakes are other sources of gelatin. Carbohydrates are disposed of three different ways. They can be combined with oxygen to produce energy, stored as glycogen in the muscle and liver, or converted to fatty acids via de novo lipogenesis, or DNL, and stored as triglyceride. A common argument against fructose is that it's shunted directly to the liver where it is converted to fat, setting the stage for fatty liver disease, diabetes, and obesity. While it is true that the liver rapidly uses fructose, it does so primarily to refill hepatic glycogen. In one study, an infusion of fructose resulted in about 360% more glycogen than a glucose infusion, and the liver's capacity for glycogen is very large. One study suggested that de novo lipogenesis or DNL is not an important pathway in humans and that chronic overfeeding on carbohydrates increased glycogen stores of about 500 grams before DNL became significant. The liver uses glycogen locally for its various tasks, so keeping it energized is a simple and effective way to support its function. Low thyroid, impaired liver function, the exchange of lactic acid for carbon dioxide, the inhibition of glucose oxidation, the increased reliance on fat as fuel, a shift towards the adaptive stress substances, and a chronic generalized state of inflammation are probably all central events in the genesis of the baldness field. The baldness field, or the classical horseshoe shape of pattern hair loss, is characterized by an increased concentration of mast cells. Mast cells are early responders to systemic hypoxia, initiating an inflammatory cascade. The concentration of mast cells in the prostate is a novel prognostic marker for prostate cancer. Baldness is strongly associated with developing prostate cancer, and perhaps the mechanisms are similar. Prolactin appears to be associated with both problems, and like all of the stress hormones, is involved in the recruitment and degranulation of mast cells. By generating carbon dioxide, active thyroid hormone is responsible for sufficiently oxygenating tissues i.e. the Bohr effect. Carbon dioxide restrains mast cells from degranulation, inhibiting the release of prostaglandins and other growth inhibitors. I think it's time to begin viewing baldness as, to steal a phrase from Ray, a regulatory weakness within the organism. I suspect that reversing the inflammatory processes that have developed over a lifetime is difficult without good nutrition and a few useful supplements. Moreover, self metrics, e.g. the resting pulse and temperature, and for some, lab work, should regularly be employed to guide the entire ship in the right direction. So that's it for me. Thank you for listening. Check out my Patreon page, which is how all this work comes to you at, at no charge and supports my ability to live, research, and eat. So I sincerely appreciate the members that uh, are supporting me on there. It's totally incredible. And uh, again, you can find all my work on dannyrati.com. You can go to the Facebook page, which is pretty active, has new content uh, Monday through Friday. Also, you can follow me on Twitter. Facebook isn't your thing. And also the YouTube channel is going pretty well, too. I've been trying to add more content to that on a regular basis. So thanks again for listening, and I'll talk to you guys soon.